Volume Two, Part Two, Chapter Sixty Three, of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby, eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume Two, Part Two, Chapter Sixty Three, of the mishap that befell Sancho Panza through the visit to the galleys and the strange adventure of the fair morisco profound were don quixote's reflections on the reply of the enchanted head not one of them however hitting on the secret of the trick but all concentrated on the promise which he regarded as a certainty of dulcinea's disenchantment this he turned over in his mind again and again with great satisfaction fully persuaded that he would shortly see its fulfilment and as for sancho though as has been said he hated being a governor still he had a longing to be giving orders and finding himself obeyed once more this is the misfortune that being in authority even in jest brings with it to resume that afternoon their host don antonio moreno and his two friends with don quixote and sancho went to the galleys the commandant had been already made aware of his good fortune in seeing two such famous persons as don quixote and sancho in the instant they came to the shore all the galleys struck their awnings and the clarions rang out a skiff covered with rich carpets and cushions of crimson velvet was immediately lowered into the water and as don quixote stepped on board of it the leading galley fired her gangway gun and the other galleys did the same and as he mounted the starboard ladder the whole crew saluted him as is the custom when a personage of distinction comes on board a galley by exclaiming who 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 three times the general for so we shall call him a valencian gentleman of rank gave him his hand and embraced him saying i shall mark this day with a white stone as one of the happiest i can expect to enjoy in my lifetime since i have seen senor don quixote of la mancha pattern and image wherein we see contained and condensed all that is worthy in knight errantry don quixote delighted beyond measure with such a lordly reception replied to him in words no less courteous all then proceeded to the poop which was very handsomely decorated and seated themselves on the bulwark benches the boatswain passed along the gangway and piped all hands to strip which they did in an instant sancho seeing such a number of men stripped to the skin was taken aback and still more when he saw them spread the awning so briskly that it seemed to him as if all the devils were at work at it but all this was cakes and fancy bread to what i am going to tell now sancho was seated on the captain's stage close to the aftermost rower on the right-hand side he previously instructed in what he was to do laid hold of sancho hoisting him up in his arms and the whole crew who were standing ready beginning on the right proceeded to pass him on whirling him along from hand to hand and from bench to bench with such rapidity that it took the sight out of poor sancho's eyes and he made quite sure that the devils themselves were flying away with him nor did they leave off with him until they had sent him back along the left side and deposited him on the poop and the poor fellow was left bruised and breathless and all in a sweat and unable to comprehend what it was that had happened to him don quixote when he saw sancho's flight without wings asked the general if this was a usual ceremony with those who came on board the galleys for the first time for if so as he had no intention of adopting them as a profession he had no mind to perform such feats of agility and if any one offered to lay hold of him to whirl him about he vowed to god he would kick his soul out and as he said this he stood up and clapped his hand upon his sword at this instant they struck the awning and lowered the yard with a prodigious rattle sancho thought heaven was coming off its hinges and going to fall on his head and full of terror he ducked it and buried it between his knees nor were don quixote's knees altogether under control for he too shook a little squeezed his shoulders together and lost colour the crew then hoisted the yard with the same rapidity and clatter as when they lowered it all the while keeping silence as though they had neither voice nor breath the boatswain gave the signal to weigh anchor and leaping upon the middle of the gangway began to lay on to the shoulders of the crew with his corbosh or whip and to haul out gradually to sea when sancho saw so many red feet for such he took the oars to be 
moving all together he said to himself it's these that are the real chanted things and not the ones my master talks of what can those wretches have done to be so whipped and how does that one man who goes along there whistling dare to whip so many i declare this is hell or at least purgatory don quixote observing how attentively sancho regarded what was going on said to him ah sancho my friend how quickly and cheaply might you finish off the disenchantment of dulcinea if you would strip to the waist and take your place among those gentlemen amid the pain and sufferings of so many you would not feel your own much and moreover perhaps the sage merlin would allow each of these lashes being laid on with a good hand to count for ten of those which you must give yourself at last the general was about to ask what these lashes were and what was dulcinea's disenchantment when a sailor exclaimed mon signals that there is an oared vessel off the coast to the west on hearing this the general sprang upon the gangway crying now then my sons don't let her give us the slip it must be some algerine corsair brigantine that the watch-tower signals to us the three others immediately came alongside the chief galley to receive their orders the general ordered two to put out to sea while he with the other kept in shore so that in this way the vessel could not escape them the crews plied the oars driving the galleys so furiously that they seemed to fly the two that had put out to sea after a couple of miles sighted a vessel which so far as they could make out they judged to be one of fourteen or fifteen banks and so she proved as soon as the vessel discovered the galleys she went about with the object and in the hope of making her escape by her speed but the attempt failed for the chief galley was one of the fastest vessels afloat and overhauled her so rapidly that they on board the brigantine saw clearly that there was no possibility of escaping and the reyes therefore would have had them drop their oars and give themselves up so as not to provoke the captain in command of our galleys to anger but chance directing things otherwise so ordered it that just as the chief galley came close enough for those on board the vessel to hear the shouts from her calling on them to surrender two torakis that is to say two turks both drunken there were a dozen more were on board the brigantine discharged their muskets killing two of the soldiers that lined the sides of our vessel seeing this the general swore he would not leave one of those he found on board the vessel alive but as he bore down furiously upon her she slipped away from him underneath the oars the galley shot a good way ahead those on board the vessel saw their case was desperate and while the galley was coming about they made sail and by sailing and rowing once more tried to sheer off but their activity did not do them as much good as their rashness did them harm for the galley coming up with them in a little more than half a mile threw her oars over them and took the whole of them alive the other two galleys now joined company and all four returned with the prize to the beach where a vast multitude stood waiting for them eager to see what they brought back the general anchored close in and perceived that the viceroy of the city was on the shore he ordered the skiff to push off to fetch him and the yard to be lowered for the purpose of hanging forthwith the reyes and the rest of the men taken on board the vessel about six and thirty in number all smart fellows and most of them turkish musketeers he asked which was the reyes of the brigantine and was answered in spanish by one of the prisoners who afterwards proved to be a spanish renegade this young man senor that you see here is our reyes and he pointed to one of the handsomest and most gallant-looking youths that could be imagined he did not seem to be twenty years of age tell me dog said the general what led thee to kill my soldiers when thou sawest it was impossible for thee to escape is that the way to behave to chief galleys knowest thou not that rashness is not valour faint prospects of success should make men bold but not rash the reyes was about to reply but the general could not at that moment listen to him as he had to hasten to receive the viceroy who was now coming on board the galley and with him certain of his attendants and some of the people you have had a good chase senor general said the viceroy your excellencies shall soon see how good by the game strung up to this yard replied the general how so returned the viceroy because said the general against all law reason and usages of war they have killed on my hands two of the best soldiers on board these galleys and i have sworn to hang every man that i have taken but above all this youth who is the reyes of the brigantine and he pointed to him as he stood with his hands already bound and the rope round his neck ready for death the viceroy looked at him 
and seeing him so well favoured so graceful and so submissive he felt a desire to spare his life the comeliness of the youth furnishing him at once with a letter of recommendation he therefore questioned him saying tell me reyes art thou turk moor or renegade to which the youth replied also in spanish i am neither turk nor moor nor renegade what art thou then said the viceroy a christian woman replied the youth a woman and a christian in such a dress and in such circumstances it is more marvellous than credible said the viceroy suspend the execution of the sentence said the youth your vengeance will not lose much by waiting while i tell you the story of my life what heart could be so hard as not to be softened by these words at any rate so far as to listen to what the unhappy youth had to say the general bade him say what he pleased but not to expect pardon for his flagrant offence with this permission the youth began in these words born of morisco parents i am of that nation more unhappy than wise upon which of late a sea of woes has poured down in the course of our misfortune i was carried to barbary by two uncles of mine for it was in vain that i declared i was a christian as in fact i am and not a mere pretended one or outwardly but a true catholic christian it availed me nothing with those charged with our sad expatriation to protest this nor would my uncles believe it on the contrary they treated it as an untruth and a subterfuge set up to enable me to remain behind in the land of my birth and so more by force than of my own will they took me with them i had a christian mother and a father who was a man of sound sense and a christian too i imbibed the catholic faith with my mother's milk i was well brought up and neither in word nor in deed did i i think show any sign of being a morisco to accompany these virtues for such i hold them my beauty if i possess any grew with my growth and great as was the seclusion in which i lived it was not so great but that a young gentleman don gaspar gregorio by name eldest son of a gentleman who was lord of a village near ours contrived to find opportunities of seeing me how he saw me how we met how his heart was lost to me and mine not kept from him would take too long to tell especially at a moment when i am in dread of the cruel cord that threatens me interposing between tongue and throat i will only say therefore that don gregorio chose to accompany me in our banishment he joined company with the moriscos who were going forth from other villages for he knew their language very well and on the voyage he struck up a friendship with my two uncles who were carrying me with them for my father like a wise and far-sighted man as soon as he heard the first edict for our expulsion quitted the village and departed in quest of some refuge for us abroad he left hidden and buried at a spot of which i alone have knowledge a large quantity of pearls and precious stones of great value together with a sum of money and gold cruzados and doubloons he charged me on no account to touch the treasure if by any chance they expelled us before his return i obeyed him and with my uncles as i have said and others of our kindred and neighbours passed over to barbary and the place where we took up our abode was algiers much the same as if we had taken it up in hell itself the king heard of my beauty and report told him of my wealth which was in some degree fortunate for me he summoned me before him and asked me what part of spain i came from and what money and jewels i had i mentioned the place and told him the jewels and money were buried there but that they might easily be recovered if i myself went back for them all this i told him in dread lest my beauty and not his own covetousness should influence him while he was engaged in conversation with me they brought him word that in company with me was one of the handsomest and most graceful youths that could be imagined i knew at once that they were speaking of don gaspar gregorio whose comeliness surpasses the most highly vaunted beauty i was troubled when i thought of the danger he was in for among those barbarous turks a fair youth is more esteemed than a woman be she ever so beautiful the king immediately ordered him to be brought before him that he might see him and asked me if what they said about the youth was true i then almost as if inspired by heaven told him it was but that i would have him to know it was not a man but a woman like myself and i entreated him to allow me to go and dress her in the attire proper to her so that her beauty might be seen to perfection and that she might present herself before him with less embarrassment he bade me go by all means and said that the next day 
we should discuss the plan to be adopted for my return to Spain, to carry away the hidden treasure. I saw Don Gaspar. I told him the danger he was in if he let it be seen he was a man. I dressed him as a Moorish woman, and that same afternoon I brought him before the king, who was charmed when he saw him, and resolved to keep the damsel and make a present of her to the grand seigneur, and to avoid the risk she might run among the women of his seraglio, and distrustful of himself, he commanded her to be placed in the house of some Moorish ladies of rank, who would protect and attend to her, and thither he was taken at once. What we both suffered, for I cannot deny that I love him, may be left to the imagination of those who are separated if they love one another dearly. The king then arranged that I should return to Spain in this brigantine, and that two Turks, those who killed your soldiers, should accompany me. There also came with me the Spanish renegade, and here she pointed to him who had first spoken, whom I know secretly to be a Christian, and to be more desirous of being left in Spain than of returning to Barbary. The rest of the crew of the brigantine are Moors and Turks, who merely serve as rowers. The two Turks, greedy and insolent, instead of obeying the orders we had to land me in this renegade in Christian dress with which we came provided, on the first Spanish ground we came to, chose to run along the coast and make some prize if they could fearing that if they put us ashore first we might in case of some accident befalling us make it known that the brigantine was at sea and thus if there happened to be any galleys on the coast they might be taken we sighted the shore last night and knowing nothing of these galleys we were discovered and the result was what you have seen to sum up there is don gregorio in woman's dress among women in imminent danger of his life and here am i with hands bound in expectation or rather in dread of losing my life of which i am already weary here sirs ends my sad story as true as it is unhappy all i ask of you is to allow me to die like a christian for as i have already said i am not to be charged with the offence of which those of my nation are guilty and she stood silent her eyes filled with moving tears accompanied by plenty from the bystanders the viceroy, touched with compassion, went up to her without speaking, and untied the cord that bound the hands of the Moorish girl. But all the while the Morisco Christian was telling her strange story, an elderly pilgrim, who had come on board of the galley at the same time as the viceroy, kept his eyes fixed upon her, and the instant she ceased speaking, he threw himself at her feet, and embracing them said in a voice broken by sobs and sighs, O oh, Anna Felix! my unhappy daughter i am thy father ricote come back to look for thee unable to live without thee my soul that thou art at these words of his sancho opened his eyes and raised his head which he had been holding down brooding over his unlucky excursion and looking at the pilgrim he recognized in him that same ricote he met the day he quitted his government and felt satisfied that this was his daughter she being now unbound embraced her father mingling her tears with his while he addressing the general and the viceroy said this sirs is my daughter more unhappy in her adventures than in her name she is anna felix surnamed ricote celebrated as much for her own beauty as for my wealth i quitted my native land in search of some shelter or refuge for us abroad and having found one in germany i returned in this pilgrim's dress in the company of some other german pilgrims to seek my daughter and take up a large quantity of treasure i had left buried my daughter i did not find the treasure i found and have with me and now in this strange roundabout way you have seen i find the treasure that more than all makes me rich my beloved daughter if our innocence and her tears and mine can with strict justice open the door to clemency extend it to us for we never had any intention of injuring you nor do we sympathize with the aims of our people, who have been justly banished. I know Ricote well, said Sancho at this, and I know, too, that what he says about Anna Felix being his daughter is true. But as to those other particulars about going and coming, and having good or bad intentions, I say nothing. While all present stood amazed at this strange occurrence, the general said, At any rate, your tears will not allow me to keep my oath. Live, fair Anna Felix all the years that heaven has allotted you but these rash insolent fellows must pay the penalty of the crime they have committed and with that he gave orders to have the two turks who had killed his two soldiers hanged at once at the yard-arm 
the viceroy however begged him earnestly not to hang them as their behaviour savoured rather of madness than of bravado the general yielded to the viceroy's request for revenge is not easily taken in cold blood they then tried to devise some scheme for rescuing don gaspar gregorio from the danger in which he had been left ricote offered for that object more than two thousand ducats that he had in pearls and gems they proposed several plans but none so good as that suggested by the renegade already mentioned who offered to return to algiers in a small vessel of about six banks manned by christian rowers as he knew where how and when he could and should land nor was he ignorant of the house in which don gaspar was staying the general and the viceroy had some hesitation about placing confidence in the renegade and entrusting him with the christians who were to row but anna felix said she could answer for him and her father offered to go and pay the ransom of the christians if by any chance they should not be forthcoming this then being agreed upon the viceroy landed and don antonio moreno took the fair morisco and her father home with him the viceroy charging him to give them the best reception and welcome in his power while on his own part he offered all that house contained for their entertainment so great was the good will and kindliness the beauty of anna felix had infused into his heart End of Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 63 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 64 Of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha By Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra Translated by John Ormsby, 1829-1895 this recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 64 Treating of the adventure which gave Don Quixote more unhappiness than all that had hitherto befallen him. The wife of Don Antonio Moreno, so the history says, was extremely happy to see Ana Felix in her house. She welcomed her with great kindness charmed as well by her beauty as by her intelligence for in both respects the fair morisco was richly endowed and all the people of the city flocked to see her as though they had been summoned by the ringing of the bells don quixote told don antonio that the plan adopted for releasing don gregorio was not a good one for its risks were greater than its advantages and that it would be better to land himself with his arms and horse in barbary for he would carry him off in spite of the whole moorish host as don jaiferos carried off his wife melisendra remember your worship observed sancho on hearing him say so senor don jaiferos carried off his wife from the mainland and took her to france by land but in this case if by chance we carry off don gregorio we have no way of bringing him to spain for there's a sea between there's a remedy for everything except death said don quixote if they bring the vessel close to the shore we shall be able to get on board though all the world strive to prevent us your worship hits it off mighty well and mighty easy said sancho but it's a long step from saying to doing and i hold to the renegade for he seems to me an honest good-hearted fellow don antonio then said that if the renegade did not prove successful the expedient of the great don quixote's expedition to barbary should be adopted two days afterwards the renegade put to sea in a light vessel of six oars aside manned by a stout crew and two days later the galleys made sail eastward the general having begged the viceroy to let him know all about the release of don gregorio and about anna felix and the viceroy promised to do as he requested one morning as don quixote went out for a stroll along the beach arrayed in full armour for as he often said that was his only gear his only rest the fray and he never was without it for a moment he saw coming towards him a knight also in full armour with a shining moon painted on his shield who on approaching sufficiently near to be heard said in a loud voice addressing himself to don quixote illustrious knight and never sufficiently extolled don quixote of la mancha i am the knight of the white moon whose unheard-of achievements will perhaps have recalled him to thy memory i come to do battle with thee and prove the might of thy arm to the end that i make thee acknowledge and confess that my lady let her be who she may is incomparably fairer than thy dulcinea del toboso if thou dost acknowledge this fairly and openly 
thou shalt escape death and save me the trouble of inflicting it upon thee if thou fightest and i vanquish thee i demand no other satisfaction than that laying aside arms and abstaining from going in quest of adventures thou withdraw and betake to thyself thine own village for the space of a year and live there without putting hand to sword in peace and quiet and beneficial repose the same being needful for the increase of thy substance and the salvation of thy soul and if thou dost vanquish me my head shall be at thy disposal my arms and horse thy spoils and the renown of my deeds transferred and added to thine consider which will be thy best course and give me thy answer speedily for this day is all the time i have for the dispatch of this business don quixote was amazed and astonished as well at the knight of the white moon's arrogance as at his reason for delivering the defiance and with calm dignity he answered him knight of the white moon of whose achievements i have never heard until now i will venture to swear you have never seen the illustrious dulcinea for had you seen her i know you would have taken care not to venture yourself upon this issue because the sight would have removed all doubt from your mind that there ever has been or can be a beauty to be compared with hers and so not saying you lie but merely that you are not correct in what you state i accept your challenge with the conditions you have proposed and at once that the day you have fixed may not expire and from your conditions i accept only that of the renown of your achievements being transferred to me for i know not of what sort they are nor what they may amount to i am satisfied with my own such as they be take therefore the side of the field you choose and i will do the same and to whom god shall give it may st peter add his blessing the knight of the white moon had been seen from the city and it was told the viceroy how he was in conversation with don quixote the viceroy fancying it must be some fresh adventure got up by don antonio moreno or some other gentleman of the city hurried out at once to the beach accompanied by don antonio and several other gentlemen just as don quixote was wheeling rocinante round in order to take up the necessary distance the viceroy upon this seeing that the pair of them were evidently preparing to come to the charge put himself between them asking them what it was that led them to engage in combat all of a sudden in this way the knight of the white moon replied that it was a question of precedence of beauty and briefly told him what he had said to don quixote and how the conditions of the defiance agreed upon both sides had been accepted the viceroy went over to don antonio and asked in a low voice did he know who the knight of the white moon was or was it some joke they were playing on don quixote don antonio replied that he neither knew who he was nor whether the defiance was in joke or in earnest this answer left the viceroy in a state of perplexity not knowing whether he ought to let the combat go on or not but unable to persuade himself that it was anything but a joke he fell back saying if there be no other way out of it gallant knights except to confess or die and don quixote is inflexible and your worship of the white moon still more so in god's hand be it and fall on he of the white moon thanked the viceroy in courteous and well-chosen words for the permission he gave them and so did don quixote who then commending himself with all his heart to heaven and to his dulcinea as was his custom on the eve of any combat that awaited him proceeded to take a little more distance as he saw his antagonist was doing the same then without blast of trumpet or other warlike instrument to give them the signal to charge both at the same instant wheeled their horses and he of the white moon being the swifter met don quixote after having traversed two-thirds of the course and there encountered him with such violence that without touching him with his lance for he held it high to all appearance purposely he hurled don quixote and rocinante to the earth a perilous fall he sprang upon him at once and placing the lance over his visor said to him you are vanquished sir knight nay dead unless you admit the conditions of our defiance don quixote bruised and stupefied without raising his visor said in a weak feeble voice as if he were speaking out of a tomb dulcinea del toboso is the fairest woman in the world and i the most unfortunate knight on earth it is not fitting that this truth should suffer by my feebleness drive your lance home sir knight and take my life since you have taken away my honour that will i not in sooth said he of the white moon live the fame of the lady dulcinea's beauty undimmed as ever all i require is that the great don quixote 
retire to his own home for a year, or for so long a time as shall by me be enjoined upon him, as we agreed before engaging in this combat. The viceroy, Don Antonio, and several others who were present heard all this, and heard too how Don Quixote replied that so long as nothing in prejudice of Dulcinea was demanded of him, he would observe all the rest like a true and loyal knight. The engagement given, he of the white moon wheeled about, and making obeisance to the viceroy with a movement of the head, rode away into the city at a half gallop. The viceroy bade Don Antonio hasten after him, and by some means or other find out who he was. They raised Don Quixote up and uncovered his face, and found him pale and bathed with sweat. Rocinante, from the mere hard measure he had received, lay unable to stir for the present. Sancho, wholly dejected and woe-begone, knew not what to say or do. He fancied that all was a dream, that the whole business was a piece of enchantment. Here was his master defeated, and bound not to take up arms for a year. He saw the light of the glory of his achievements obscured, the hopes of the promises lately made him, swept away like smoke before the wind. Rocinante, he feared, was crippled for life, and his master's bones out of joint. For if he were only shaken out of his madness, it would be no small luck. In the end they carried him into the city in a hand-chair which the viceroy sent for, and thither the viceroy himself returned, eager to ascertain who this knight of the white moon was, who had left Don Quixote in such a sad plight. End of Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 64 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 65 Of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha By Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra Translated by John Ormsby, 1829-1895 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 65 Wherein is made known who the Knight of the White Moon was, likewise Don Gregorio's release and other events. Don Antonio Moreno followed the Knight of the White Moon, and a number of boys followed him too, nay, pursued him, until they had him fairly housed in a hostel in the heart of the city don antonio eager to make his acquaintance entered also a squire came out to meet him and remove his armour and he shut himself into a lower room still attended by don antonio whose bread would not bake until he had found out who he was he of the white moon seeing then that the gentleman would not leave him said i know very well senor what you have come for it is to find out who i am and as there is no reason why i should conceal it from you while my servant here is taking off my armour, I will tell you the true state of the case, without leaving out anything. You must know, senor, that I am called the bachelor Samson Carrasco. I am of the same village as Don Quixote of La Mancha, whose craze and folly make all of us who know him feel pity for him. And I am one of those who have felt it most, and persuaded that his chance of recovery lay in quiet and keeping at home and in his own house, I hit upon a device for keeping him there. Three months ago, therefore, I went out to meet him as a knight-errant, under the assumed name of the Knight of the Mirrors, intending to engage him in combat, and overcome him without hurting him, making it the condition of our combat that the vanquished should be at the disposal of the victor. What I meant to demand of him, for I regarded him as vanquished already, was that he should return to his own village, and not leave it for a whole year, by which time he might be cured. But fate ordered it otherwise for he vanquished me and unhorsed me, and so my plan failed. He went his way, and I came back conquered, covered with shame and sorely bruised by my fall, which was a particularly dangerous one. But this did not quench my desire to meet him again and overcome him, as you have seen to-day. And as he is so scrupulous in his observance of the laws of knight-errantry, he will no doubt, in order to keep his word, obey the injunction I have laid upon him this senor is how the matter stands and i have nothing more to tell you i implore of you not to betray me or tell don quixote who i am so that my honest endeavours may be successful and that a man of excellent wits were he only rid of the fooleries of chivalry 
may get them back again oh senor said don antonio may god forgive you the wrong you have done the whole world in trying to bring the most amusing madman in it back to his senses do you not see senor that the gain by don quixote's sanity can never equal the enjoyment his crazes give but my belief is that all the senor bachelor's pains will be of no avail to bring a man so hopelessly cracked to his senses again and if it were not uncharitable i would say may don quixote never be cured for if by his recovery we lose not only his own drolleries but his squire sancho panza's too any one of which is enough to turn melancholy itself into merriment however i'll hold my peace and say nothing to him and we'll see whether i am right in my suspicion that senor carrasco's efforts will be fruitless the bachelor replied that at all events the affair promised well and he hoped for a happy result from it and putting his services at don antonio's commands he took leave of him and having had his armour packed at once upon a mule he rode away from the city the same day on the horse he rode to battle and returned to his own country without meeting any adventure calling for record in this voracious history don antonio reported to the viceroy what carrasco told him and the viceroy was not very well pleased to hear it for with don quixote's retirement there was an end to the amusement of all who knew anything of his mad doings six days did don quixote keep his bed dejected melancholy moody and out of sorts brooding over the unhappy event of his defeat sancho strove to comfort him and among other things he said to him hold up your head senor and be of good cheer if you can and give thanks to heaven that if you have had a tumble to the ground you have not come off with a broken rib and as you know that where they give they take and that there are not always fletches where there are pegs a fig for the doctor for there's no need of him to cure this ailment let us go home and give over going about in search of adventures in strange lands and places rightly looked at it is i that i am the greater loser though it is your worship that has had the worse usage with the government i gave up all wish to be a governor again but i did not give up all longing to be a count and that will never come to pass if your worship gives up becoming a king by renouncing the calling of chivalry and so my hopes are going to turn into smoke peace sancho said don quixote thou seest my suspension in retirement is not to exceed a year i shall soon return to my honoured calling and i shall not be at a loss for a kingdom to win and a county to bestow on thee may god hear it and sin be deaf said sancho i have always heard say that a good hope is better than a bad holding as they were talking don antonio came in looking extremely pleased and exclaiming reward me for my good news senor don quixote don gregorio and the renegade who went for him have come ashore ashore do i say they are by this time in the viceroy's house and will be here immediately don quixote cheered up a little and said of a truth i am almost ready to say i should have been glad had it turned out just the other way for it would have obliged me to cross over to barbary where by the might of my arm i should have restored to liberty not only don gregorio but all the christian captives there are in barbary but what am i saying miserable being that i am am i not he that has been conquered am i not he that has been overthrown am i not he who must not take up arms for a year then what am i making professions for what am i bragging about when it is fitter for me to handle the distaff than the sword no more of that senor said sancho let the hen live even though it be with her pip to-day for thee and to-morrow for me in these affairs of encounters and wax one must not mind them for he that falls to-day may get up to-morrow unless indeed he chooses to lie in bed i mean gives way to weakness and does not pluck up fresh spirit for fresh battles let your worship get up now to receive don gregorio for the household seems to be in a bustle and no doubt he has come by this time and so it proved for as soon as don gregorio and the renegade had given the viceroy an account of the voyage out and home don gregorio eager to see ana felix came with the renegade to don antonio's house when they carried him away from algiers he was in woman's dress on board the vessel however he exchanged it for that of a captive who escaped with him but in whatever dress he might be he looked like one to be loved and served and esteemed for he was surpassingly well favoured and to judge by appearances some seventeen or eighteen years of age 
Ricote and his daughter came out to welcome him, the father with tears, the daughter with bashfulness. They did not embrace each other, for where there is deep love there will never be overmuch boldness. Seen side by side, the comeliness of Don Gregorio and the beauty of Anna Felix were the admiration of all who were present. It was silence that spoke for the lovers at that moment, and their eyes were the tongues that declared their pure and happy feelings. The renegade explained the measures and means he had adopted to rescue Don Gregorio, and Don Gregorio at no great length, but in a few words, in which he showed that his intelligence was in advance of his years, described the peril and embarrassment he found himself in among the women with whom he had sojourned. To conclude, Ricote liberally recompensed and rewarded as well the renegade as the men who had rowed, and the renegade effected his readmission into the body of the church and was reconciled with it, and from a rotten limb became by penance and repentance a clean and sound one. Two days later the viceroy discussed with Don Antonio the steps they should take to enable Anna Felix and her father to stay in Spain, for it seemed to them there could be no objection to a daughter who was so good a Christian, and a father to all appearance so well disposed remaining there. Don Antonio offered to arrange the matter at the capital, whither he was compelled to go on some other business, hinting that many a difficult affair was settled there with the help of favour and bribes. Nay, said Ricote, who was present during the conversation, it will not do to rely upon favour or bribes, because with the great Don Bernardino de Velasco, Conde de Salazar, to whom his majesty has entrusted our expulsion, neither entreaties nor promises, bribes nor appeals to compassion are of any use. For though it is true he mingles mercy with justice, still seeing that the whole body of our nation is tainted and corrupt he applies to it the cautery that burns rather than the salve that soothes and thus by prudence sagacity care and the fear he inspires he has borne on his mighty shoulders the weight of this great policy and carried it into effect all our schemes and plots importunities and wiles being ineffectual to blind his argus eyes ever on the watch lest one of us should remain behind in concealment and like a hidden root come in course of time to sprout and bear poisonous fruit in spain now cleansed and relieved of the fear in which our vast numbers kept it heroic resolve of the great philip the third and unparalleled wisdom to have entrusted it to the said don bernardino de velasco at any rate said don antonio when i am there i will make all possible efforts and let heaven do as pleases it best don gregorio would come with me to relieve the anxiety which his parents must be suffering on account of his absence anna felix will remain in my house with my wife or in a monastery and i know the viceroy will be glad that the worthy ricote should stay with him until we see what terms i can make the viceroy agreed to all that was proposed but don gregorio on learning what had passed declared he could not and would not on any account leave anna felix however as it was his purpose to go and see his parents and devise some way of returning for her he fell in with the proposed arrangement anna felix remained with don antonio's wife and ricote in the viceroy's house the day for don antonio's departure came and two days later that for don quixote's and sancho's for don quixote's fall did not suffer him to take the road sooner there were tears and sighs swoonings and sobs at the parting between Don Gregorio and Anna Felix, Ricote offered Don Gregorio a thousand crowns if he would have them, but he would not take any, save five, which Don Antonio lent him, and he promised to repay at the capital. So the two of them took their departure, and Don Quixote and Sancho afterwards, as has been already said, Don Quixote without his armor and in travelling gear, and Sancho on foot, Dapple being loaded with the armor. End of Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 65 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 66 Of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha By Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra Translated by John Ormsby, 1829-1895 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 66 
which treats of what he who reads will see or what he who has it read to him will hear as he left barcelona don quixote turned gaze upon the spot where he had fallen here troy was said he here my ill luck not my cowardice robbed me of all the glory i had won here fortune made me the victim of her caprices here the lustre of my achievements was dimmed here in a word fell my happiness never to arise again senor said sancho on hearing this it is the part of brave hearts to be patient in adversity just as much as to be glad in prosperity i judge by myself for if when i was a governor i was glad now that i am a squire and on foot i am not sad and i have heard say that she whom commonly they call fortune is a drunken whimsical jade and what is more blind and therefore neither sees what she does nor knows whom she casts down or whom she sets up thou art a great philosopher sancho said don quixote thou speakest very sensibly i know not who taught thee but i can tell thee there is no such thing as fortune in the world nor does anything which takes place there be it good or bad come about by chance but by the special preordination of heaven and hence a common saying that each of us is the maker of his own fortune i have been that of mine but not with the proper amount of prudence and my self-confidence has therefore made me pay dearly for i ought to have reflected that rocinante's feeble strength could not resist the mighty bulk of the knight of the white moon's horse in a word i ventured it i did my best i was overthrown but though i lost my honour i did not lose nor can i lose the virtue of keeping my word when i was a knight-errant daring and valiant i supported my achievements by hand and deed and now that i am a humble squire i will support my words by keeping the promise i have given forward then sancho my friend let us go to keep the year of the novitiate in our own country and in that seclusion we shall pick up fresh strength to return to the by me never forgotten calling of arms senor returned sancho travelling on foot is not such a pleasant thing that it makes me feel disposed or tempted to make long marches let us leave this armour hung up on some tree instead of someone that has been hanged and then with me on dapple's back and my feet off the ground we will arrange the stages as your worship pleases to measure them out but to suppose that i am going to travel on foot and make long ones is to suppose nonsense thou sayest well sancho said don quixote let my armour be hung up for a trophy and under it or around it we will carve on the trees what was inscribed on the trophy of roland's armour these let none move who dareth not his might with roland prove that's the very thing said sancho and if it was not that we should feel the want of rocinante on the road it would be as well to leave him hung up too and yet i had rather not have either him or the armour hung up said don quixote that it may not be said for good service a bad return your worship is right said sancho for as sensible people hold the fault of the ass must not be laid on the pack-saddle and as in this affair the fault is your worship's punish yourself and don't let your anger break out against the already battered and bloody armour or the meekness of rocinante or the tenderness of my feet trying to make them travel more than is reasonable in converse of this sort the whole of that day went by as did the four succeeding ones without anything occurring to interrupt their journey but on the fifth as they entered a village they found a great number of people at the door of an inn enjoying themselves as it was a holiday upon don quixote's approach a peasant called out one of these two gentlemen who come here and who don't know the parties will tell us what we ought to do about our wager that i will certainly said don quixote and according to the rights of the case if i can manage to understand it well here it is worthy sir said the peasant a man of this village who is so fat that he weighs twenty stone challenged another a neighbour of his who does not weigh more than nine to run a race the agreement was that they were to run a distance of a hundred paces with equal weights and when the challenger was asked how the weights were to be equalized he said that the other as he weighed nine stone should put eleven in iron on his back and that in this way the twenty stone of the thin man would equal the twenty stone of the fat one not at all exclaimed sancho at once before don quixote could answer it's for me that only a few days ago left off being a governor and a judge as all the world knows to settle these doubtful questions and give an opinion in disputes of all sorts answer in god's name sancho my friend said don quixote 
for I am not fit to give crumbs to a cat. My wits are so confused and upset. With this permission, Sancho said to the peasants who stood clustered round him, waiting with open mouths for the decision to come from his, Brothers, what the fat man requires is not in reason, nor has it a shadow of justice in it, because, if it be true, as they say, that the challenged may choose the weapons, the other has no right to choose such as will prevent and keep him from winning. My decision, therefore, is that the fat challenger prune, peel, thin, trim, and correct himself, and take eleven stone of his flesh off his body, here or there, as he pleases, and as suits him best, and being in this way reduced to nine stone weight, he will make himself equal and even with nine stone of his opponent, and they will be able to run on equal terms. Why, all that's good, said one of the peasants, as he heard Sancho's decision, but the gentleman has spoken like a saint, and given judgment like a canon. But I'll be bound the fat man won't part with an ounce of his flesh, not to say eleven stone. The best plan will be for them not to run, said another, so that neither the thin man break down under the weight, nor the fat one strip himself of his flesh. Let half the wager be spent in wine, and let's take these gentlemen to the tavern where there's the best, and over me be the cloak when it rains. I thank you, sir, said Don Quixote, but I cannot stop for an instant for sad thoughts and unhappy circumstances forced me to seem discourteous and to travel apace. And spurring Rocinante he pushed on, leaving them wondering at what they had seen and heard, at his own strange figure and at the shrewdness of his servant, for such they took Sancho to be. And another of them observed, If the servant is so clever, what must the master be? I'll bet, if they are going to Salamanca to study, they'll come to be alcaldes of the court in a trice for it's a mere joke only to read and read and have interest and good luck and before a man knows where he is he finds himself with a staff in his hand or a mitre on his head that night master and man passed out in the fields in the open air and the next day as they were pursuing their journey they saw coming towards them a man on foot with alforjas at the neck and a javelin or spiked staff in his hand the very cut of a foot courier who as soon as he came close to don quixote increased his pace and half running came up to him and embracing his right thigh for he could reach no higher exclaimed with evident pleasure oh senor don quixote of la mancha what happiness it will be to the heart of my lord the duke when he knows your worship is coming back to his castle for he is still there with my lady the duchess i do not recognize you friend said don quixote nor do i know who you are unless you tell me i am tosilos my lord the duke's lackey senor don quixote replied the courier he who refused to fight your worship about marrying the daughter of don rodriguez god bless me exclaimed don quixote is it possible that you are the one whom mine enemies the enchanters changed into the lackey you speak of in order to rob me of the honour of that battle nonsense good sir said the messenger there was no enchantment or transformation at all i entered the list just as much lackey to Silos, as i came out of them lackey tosilos i thought to marry without fighting for the girl had taken my fancy but my scheme had a very different result for as soon as your worship had left the castle my lord the duke had a hundred strokes of the stick given me for having acted contrary to the orders he gave me before engaging in the combat and the end of the whole affair is that the girl has become a nun and dona rodriguez has gone back to castile and i am now on my way to barcelona with a packet of letters for the viceroy which my master is sending him if your worship would like a drop sound though warm i have a gourd here full of the best and some scraps of tronchon cheese that will serve as a provocative and wakener of your thirst if so be it is asleep i take the offer said sancho no more compliments about it pour out good tosilos in spite of all the enchanters in the indies thou art indeed the greatest glutton in the world sancho said don quixote and the greatest booby on earth not to be able to see that this courier is enchanted and this tosilos a sham one stop with him and take thy fill i will go on slowly and wait for thee to come up with me the lackey laughed unsheathed his gourd unwalleted his scraps and taking out a small loaf of bread he and sancho seated themselves on the green grass and in peace and good fellowship finished off the contents of the alforjas down to the bottom so resolutely that they licked the wrapper of the letters merely because it smelt of cheese said tosilos to sancho beyond a doubt sancho my friend this master of thine ought to be a madman ought said sancho 
he owes no man anything he pays for everything particularly when the coin is madness i see it plain enough and i tell him so plain enough but what's the use especially now that it is all over with him for here he is beaten by the knight of the white moon dosilos begged him to explain what had happened him but sancho replied that it would not be good manners to leave his master waiting for him and that some other day if they met there would be time enough for that and then getting up after shaking his doublet and brushing the crumbs out of his beard he drove dapple on before him and bidding adieu to tosilos left him and rejoined his master who was waiting for him under the shade of a tree end of volume two part two chapter sixty six recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter sixty seven of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes saavedra translated by john ormsby eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter sixty seven of the resolution don quixote formed to turn shepherd and to take to a life in the fields while the year for which he had given his word was running its course with other events truly delectable and happy if a multitude of reflections used to harass don quixote before he had been overthrown a great many more harassed him since his fall he was under the shade of a tree as has been said and there like flies on honey thoughts came crowding upon him and stinging him some of them turned upon the disenchantment of dulcinea others upon the life he was about to lead in his enforced retirement sancho came up and spoke in high praise of the generous disposition of the lackey tosilos is it possible sancho said don quixote that thou dost still think that he yonder is a real lackey apparently it has escaped thy memory that thou hast seen dulcinea turned and transformed into a peasant wench and the knight of the mirrors into the bachelor carrasco all the work of the enchanters that persecute me but tell me now didst thou ask this tosilos as thou callest him what has become of altisidora did she weep over my absence or has she already consigned to oblivion the love thoughts that used to afflict her when i was present the thoughts that i had said sancho were not such as to leave time for asking fools questions body o me senor is your worship in a condition now to inquire into other people's thoughts above all love thoughts look ye sancho said don quixote there is a great difference between what is done out of love and what is done out of gratitude a knight may very possibly be proof against love but it is impossible strictly speaking for him to be ungrateful altisidora to all appearance loved me truly she gave me the three kerchiefs thou knowest of she wept at my departure she cursed me she abused me casting shame to the wind she bewailed herself in public all signs that she adored me for the wrath of lovers always ends in curses i had no hopes to give her nor treasures to offer her for mine are given to dulcinea and the treasures of knights errant are like those of the fairies illusory and deceptive all i can give her is the place in my memory i keep for her without prejudice however to that which i hold devoted to dulcinea whom thou art wronging by thy remissness in whipping thyself and scourging that flesh would that i saw it eaten by wolves which would rather keep itself for the worms than for the relief of that poor lady senor replied sancho if the truth is to be told i cannot persuade myself that the whipping of my backside has anything to do with the disenchantment of the enchanted it is like saying if your head aches rub ointment on your knees at any rate i make bold to swear that in all the histories dealing with knight errantry that your worship has read you have never come across anybody disenchanted by whipping but whether or no i'll whip myself when i have a fancy for it and the opportunity serves for scourging myself comfortably god grant it said don quixote and heaven give thee grace to take it to heart and own the obligation thou art under to help my lady who is thine also inasmuch as thou art mine as they pursued their journey talking in this way they came to the very same spot where they had been trampled on by the bulls don quixote recognized it and said he to sancho this is the meadow where we came upon those gay shepherdesses and gallant shepherds who were trying to revive and imitate the pastoral arcadia there 
an idea as novel as it was happy in emulation whereof if so be thou dost approve of it sancho i would have ourselves turned shepherds at any rate for the time i have to live in retirement i will buy some ewes and everything else requisite for the pastoral calling and i under the name of the shepherd quixotiza and thou as the shepherd panzino we will roam the woods and groves and meadows singing songs here lamenting in elegies there drinking of the crystal waters of the springs or limpid brooks or flowing rivers the oaks will yield us their sweet fruit with bountiful hand the trunks of the hard cork trees a seat the willows shade the roses perfume the wide-spread meadows carpets tinted with a thousand dyes the clear pure air will give us breath the moon and stars lighten the darkness of the night for us song shall be our delight lamenting our joy apollo will supply us with verses and love with conceits whereby we shall make ourselves famed for ever not only in this but in ages to come egad said sancho but that sort of life squares nay corners with my notions and what is more the bachelor samson carrasco and master nicholas the barber won't have well seen it before they'll want to follow it and turn shepherds along with us and god grant it may not come into the curate's head to join the sheepfold too he's so jovial and fond of enjoying himself thou art in the right of it sancho said don quixote and the bachelor samson carrasco if he enters the pastoral fraternity as no doubt he will may call himself the shepherd samsonino or perhaps the shepherd carrascon nicholas the barber may call himself nicoloso as old boskin formerly was called nemoroso as for the curate i don't know what name we can fit to him unless it be something derived from his title and we call him the shepherd curiambro for the shepherdesses whose lovers we shall be we can pick names as we would pairs and as my lady's name does just as well for a shepherdesses as for a princess's i need not trouble myself to look for one that will suit her better to thine sancho thou canst give what name thou wilt i don't mean to give her any but tarasonia said sancho which will go well with her stoutness and with her own right name as she is called teresa and then when i sing her praises in my verses i'll show how chaste my passion is for i'm not going to look for better bread than ever came from wheat in other men's houses it won't do for the curate to have a shepherdess for the sake of good example and if the bachelor chooses to have one that is his lookout god bless me sancho my friend said don quixote what a life we shall lead what hoboys and zamora bagpipes we shall hear what tabors timbrels and rebecks and then if among all these different sorts of music that of the alboges is heard almost all the pastoral instruments will be there what are alboges said sancho for i never in my life heard tell of them or saw them alboges said don quixote are brass plates like candlesticks that struck against one another on the hollow side make a noise which if not very pleasing or harmonious is not disagreeable and accords very well with the rude notes of the bagpipe and tabor the word albogue is morisco as are all those in our spanish tongue that begin with al for example almahaza almorzar alhombra algacil alhusema almacen alcancia and others of the same sort of which there are not many more our language has only three that are morisco and end in i which are borsegui vaquizami and maravedi alheli and alfaki are seen to be arabic as well by the al at the beginning as by the i they end with i mention this incidentally the chance allusion to albogues having reminded me of it and it will be of great assistance to us in the perfect practice of this calling that i am something of a poet as thou knowest and that besides the bachelor samson carrasco is an accomplished one of the curate i say nothing but i will wager he has some spice of the poet in him and no doubt master nicholas too for all barbers or most of them are guitar players and stringers of verses i will bewail my separation thou shalt glorify thyself as a constant lover the shepherd carrascon will figure as a rejected one and the curate curiambro as whatever may please him best and so all will go as gaily as heart could wish to this sancho made answer i am so unlucky senor that i am afraid the day will never come when i'll see myself at such a calling oh what neat spoons i'll make when i'm a shepherd what messes creams garlands pastoral odds and ends and if they don't get me a name for wisdom they'll not fail to get me one for ingenuity my daughter sanchica will bring us our dinner to the pasture but stay she's good-looking and shepherds there are with more mischief than simplicity in them 
I would not have her come for wool and go back shorn. Love-making and lawless desires are just as common in the fields as in the cities, and in shepherd shanties as in royal palaces. Do away with the cause, you do away with the sin. If eyes don't see, hearts don't break, and better a clear escape than good men's prayers. A truce to thy proverbs, Sancho, exclaimed Don Quixote. Any one of those thou hast uttered would suffice to explain thy meaning. Many a time have I recommended thee not to be so lavish with proverbs, and to exercise some moderation in delivering them. But it seems to me it is only preaching in the desert. My mother beats me, and I go on with my tricks. It seems to me, said Sancho, that your worship is like the common saying, said the frying pan to the kettle, get away, black breech. You chide me for uttering proverbs, and you string them in couples yourself. Observe, Sancho, replied Don Quixote, I bring in proverbs to the purpose, and when I quote them, they fit like a ring to the finger. Thou bringest them in by the head and shoulders in such a way that thou dost drag them in rather than introduce them. If I am not mistaken, I have told thee already that proverbs are short maxims drawn from the experience and observation of our wise men of old. But the proverb that is not to the purpose is a piece of nonsense and not a maxim. But enough of this. As nightfall is drawing on, let us retire some little distance from the high road to pass the night. What is in store for us to-morrow, God knoweth. They turned aside and supped late and poorly, very much against Sancho's will, who turned over in his mind the hardships attendant upon night errantry in woods and forests, even though at times plenty presented itself in castles and houses, as at Don Diego de Miranda's, at the wedding of Camacho the Rich, and at Don Antonio Moreno's. He reflected, however, that it could not be always day nor always night, and so that night he passed in sleeping and his master in waking. End of Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 67 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 68 of the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra translated by John Ormsby eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in Bangor Maine volume two part two chapter sixty eight of the bristly adventure that befell Don Quixote the night was somewhat dark for though there was a moon in the sky, it was not in a quarter where she could be seen. For sometimes the Lady Diana goes on a stroll to the Antipodes, and leaves the mountains all black and the valleys in darkness. Don Quixote obeyed nature so far as to sleep his first sleep, but did not give way to the second, very different from Sancho, who never had any second, because with him sleep lasted from night till morning, wherein he showed what a sound constitution and few cares he had. Don Quixote's cares kept him restless, so much so that he awoke Sancho and said to him, I am amazed, Sancho, at the unconcern of thy temperament. I believe thou art made of marble or hard brass, incapable of any emotion or feeling whatever. I lie awake while thou sleepest, I weep while thou singest, I am faint with fasting, while thou art sluggish and torpid from pure repletion. It is the duty of good servants to share the sufferings and feel the sorrows of their masters, if it be only for the sake of appearances. See the calmness of the night, the solitude of the spot, inviting us to break our slumbers by a vigil of some sort. Rise as thou livest, and retire a little distance, and with a good heart and cheerful courage, give thyself three or four hundred lashes on account of Dulcinea's disenchantment score. And this I entreat of thee, making it a request, for I have no desire to come to grips with thee a second time, as I know thou hast a heavy hand. As soon as thou hast laid them on, we will pass the rest of the night, I singing my separation, thou thy constancy, making a beginning at once with the pastoral life we are to follow at our village. Senor, replied Sancho, I am no monk to get up out of the middle of my sleep and scourge myself, nor does it seem to me that one can pass from one extreme of the pain of whipping to the other of music will your worship let me sleep and not worry me about whipping myself or you'll make me swear never to touch a hair of my doublet not to say my flesh oh hard heart said don quixote oh pitiless squire oh bread ill bestowed and favours ill acknowledged 
both those i have done thee and those i mean to do thee through me hast thou seen thyself a governor and through me thou seest thyself in immediate expectation of being a count or obtaining some other equivalent title for i post tenebras spero lucem i don't know what that is said sancho all i know is that so long as i am asleep i have neither fear nor hope trouble nor glory and good luck betide him that invented sleep the cloak that covers over all a man's thoughts the food that removes hunger the drink that drives away thirst the fire that warms the cold the cold that tempers the heat and to wind up with the universal coin wherewith everything is bought the weight and balance that makes the shepherd equal with the king and the fool with the wise man sleep i have heard say has only one fault that it is like death for between a sleeping man and a dead man there is very little difference never have i heard thee speak so elegantly as now sancho said don quixote and here i begin to see the truth of the proverb thou dost sometimes quote not with whom thou art bred but with whom thou art fed ha by my life master mine said sancho it's not i that am stringing proverbs now for they drop in pairs from your worship's mouth faster than from mine only there is this difference between mine and yours that yours are well timed and mine are untimely but anyhow they are all proverbs at this point they became aware of a harsh indistinct noise that seemed to spread through all the valleys around don quixote stood up and laid his hand upon his sword and sancho ensconced himself under dapple and put the bundle of armour on one side of him and the ass's pack saddle on the other in fear and trembling as great as don quixote's perturbation each instant the noise increased and came nearer to the two terrified men or at least to one for as to the other his courage is known to all the fact of the matter was that some men were taking above six hundred pigs to sell at a fair and were on their way with them at that hour and so great was the noise they made in their grunting and blowing that they deafened the ears of don quixote and sancho panza and they could not make out what it was the widespread grunting drove came on in a surging mass and without showing any respect for don quixote's dignity or sancho's passed right over the pair of them demolishing sancho's entrenchments and not only upsetting don quixote but sweeping rocinante off his feet into the bargain and what with the trampling and the grunting and the pace at which the unclean beasts went pack-saddle armour dapple and rocinante were left scattered on the ground and sancho and don quixote at their wits end sancho got up as well as he could and begged his master to give him his sword saying he wanted to kill half a dozen of those dirty unmannerly pigs for he had by this time found out that that was what they were let them be my friend said don quixote this insult is the penalty of my sin and it is the righteous chastisement of heaven that jackals should devour a vanquished knight and wasps sting him and pigs trample him under foot i suppose it is the chastisement of heaven too said sancho that flies should prick the squires of vanquished knights and lice eat them and hunger assail them if we squires were the sons of the knights we serve or their very near relations it would be no wonder if the penalty of their misdeeds overtook us even to the fourth generation but what have the ponzas to do with the quixotes well well let's lie down again and sleep out what little of the night there's left and god will send us dawn and we shall be all right sleep thou sancho returned don quixote for thou wast born to sleep as i was born to watch and during the time it now wants of dawn i will give a loose rein to my thoughts and seek a vent for them in a little madrigal which unknown to thee i composed in my head last night i should think said sancho that the thoughts that allow one to make verses cannot be of great consequence let your worship string verses as much as you like and i'll sleep as much as i can and forthwith taking the space of ground he required he muffled himself up and fell into a sound sleep undisturbed by bond debt or trouble of any sort don quixote propped up against the trunk of a beech or a cork tree for seed hamet does not specify what kind of tree it was sang in this strain to the accompaniment of his own sighs when in my mind i muse o love upon thy cruelty to death i flee in hope therein the end of all to find but drawing near that welcome haven in my sea of woe such joy i know that life revives and still i linger here 
thus life doth slay and death again to life restoreth me strange destiny that deals with life and death as with a play he accompanied each verse with many sighs and not a few tears just like one whose heart was pierced with grief at his defeat and his separation from dulcinea and now daylight came and the sun smote sancho on the eyes with his beams he awoke roused himself up shook himself and stretched his lazy limbs and seeing the havoc the pigs had made with his stores he cursed the drove and more besides then the pair resumed their journey and as evening closed in they saw coming towards them some ten men on horseback and four or five on foot don quixote's heart beat quick and sancho's quailed with fear for the persons approaching them carried lances and bucklers and were in very warlike guise don quixote turned to sancho and said if i could make use of my weapons and my promise had not tied my hands i would count this host that comes against us but cakes and fancy bread but perhaps it may prove something different from what we apprehend the men on horseback now came up and raising their lances surrounded don quixote in silence and pointed them at his back and breast menacing him with death one of those on foot putting his finger to his lips as a sign to him to be silent seized rocinante's bridle and drew him out of the road and the others driving sancho and dapple before them and all maintaining a strange silence followed in the steps of the one who led don quixote the latter two or three times attempted to ask where they were taking him to and what they wanted but the instant he began to open his lips they threatened to close them with the points of their lances and sancho fared the same way for the moment he seemed about to speak one of those on foot punched him with a goad and dapple likewise as if he too wanted to talk night set in they quickened their pace and the fears of the two prisoners grew greater especially as they heard themselves assailed with get on ye troglodytes silence ye barbarians march ye cannibals no murmuring ye scythians don't open your eyes ye murderous polyphemies ye bloodthirsty lions and such like names with which their captors harass the ears of the wretched master and man sancho went along saying to himself we tortolites barbers animals i don't like these names at all it's in a bad wind our corn is being winnowed misfortune comes upon us all at once like sticks on a dog and god grant it may be no worse than them that this unlucky adventure has in store for us don quixote rode completely dazed unable with the aid of all his wits to make out what could be the meaning of these abusive names they called them and the only conclusion he could arrive at was that there was no good to be hoped for and much evil to be feared and now about an hour after midnight they reached a castle which don quixote saw at once was the duke's where they had been but a short time before god bless me said he as he recognized the mansion what does this mean it is all courtesy and politeness in this house but with the vanquished good turns into evil and evil into worse they entered the chief court of the castle and found it prepared and fitted up in a style that added to their amazement and doubled their fears as will be seen in the following chapter end of volume two part two chapter sixty eight recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter sixty nine of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes saavedra translated by john ormsby eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter sixty nine of the strangest and most extraordinary adventure that befell don quixote in the whole course of this great history the horsemen dismounted and together with the men on foot without a moment's delay taking up sancho and don quixote bodily they carried them into the court all round which near a hundred torches fixed in sockets were burning besides above five hundred lamps in the corridors so that in spite of the night which was somewhat dark the want of daylight could not be perceived in the middle of the court was a catafalque raised about two yards above the ground and covered completely by an immense canopy of black velvet and on the steps all round it white wax tapers burned in more than a hundred silver candlesticks upon the catafalque was seen the dead body of a damsel so lovely 
that by her beauty she made death itself look beautiful she lay with her head resting upon a cushion of brocade and crowned with a garland of sweet-smelling flowers of diverse sorts her hand crossed upon her bosom and between them a branch of yellow palm of victory on one side of the court was erected a stage where upon two chairs were seated two persons who from having crowns on their heads and sceptres in their hands appeared to be kings of some sort whether real or mock ones by the side of this stage which was reached by steps were two other chairs on which the men carrying the prisoners seated don quixote and sancho all in silence and by signs giving them to understand that they too were to be silent which however they would have been without any signs for their amazement at all they saw held them tongue-tied and now two persons of distinction who were at once recognized by don quixote as his hosts the duke and duchess ascended the stage attended by a numerous suite and seated themselves on two gorgeous chairs close to the two kings as they seemed to be who would not have been amazed at this nor was this all for don quixote had perceived that the dead body on the catafalque was that of the fair altisidora as the duke and duchess mounted the stage don quixote and sancho rose and made them a profound obeisance which they returned by bowing their heads slightly at this moment an official crossed over and approaching sancho threw over him a robe of black buckram painted all over with flames of fire and taking off his cap put upon his head a mitre such as those undergoing the sentence of the holy office wear and whispered in his ear that he must not open his lips or they would put a gag upon him or take his life sancho surveyed himself from head to foot and saw himself all ablaze with flames but as they did not burn him he did not care two farthings for them he took off the mitre and seeing it painted with devils he put it on again saying to himself well so far those don't burn me nor do these carry me off don quixote surveyed him too and though fear had got the better of his faculties he could not help smiling to see the figure sancho presented and now from underneath the catafalque so it seemed there rose a low sweet sound of flutes which coming unbroken by human voice for their silence itself kept silence had a soft and languishing effect then beside the pillow of what seemed to be the dead body suddenly appeared a fair youth in a roman habit who to the accompaniment of a harp which he himself played sang in a sweet and clear voice these two stanzas while fair altisidora who the sport of cold don quixote's cruelty hath been returns to life and in this magic court the dames in sables come to grace the scene and while her matrons all in seemly sort my lady robes in bays and bombazine her beauty and her sorrows will i sing with defter quill than touch the thracian string but not in life alone methinks to me belongs the office lady when my tongue is cold in death believe me unto thee my voice shall raise its tributary song my soul from this strait prison house set free as o'er the stygian lake it floats along thy praises singing still shall hold its way and make the waters of oblivion stay at this point one of the two that looked like kings exclaimed enough enough divine singer it would be an endless task to put before us now the death and the charms of the peerless altisidora not dead as the ignorant world imagines but living in the voice of fame and in the penance which sancho panza here present has to undergo to restore her to the long-lost light do thou therefore o rhadamanthus who sittest in judgment with me in the murky caverns of dis as thou knowest all that the inscrutable fates have decreed touching the resuscitation of this damsel announce and declare it at once that the happiness we look forward to from her restoration be no longer deferred no longer had minos the fellow judge of rhadamanthus said this than rhadamanthus rising up said ho oh, officials of this house high and low great and small make haste hither one and all and print on sancho's face four and twenty smacks and give him twenty pinches and six pin thrusts in the back and arms for upon this ceremony depends the restoration of altisidora on hearing this sancho broke silence and cried out by all that's good i'll as soon let my face be smacked or handled as turn more body o me what is handling my face got to do with the resurrection of this damsel the old woman took kindly to the blitz they enchant dulcinea and whip me in order to disenchant her 
Altisidora dies of ailments God was pleased to send her, and to bring her to life again they must give me four and twenty smacks, and prick holes in my body with pins, and raise wheels on my arms with pinches. Try those jokes on a brother-in-law. I am an old dog, and tus tus is no use with me. Thou shalt die, said Rodamanthus in a loud voice. Relent, thou tiger, humble thyself, proud Nimrod. Suffer and be silent, for no impossibilities are asked of thee. It is not for thee to inquire into the difficulties in this matter. Smacked thou must be, pricked thou shalt see thyself, and with pinches thou must be made to howl. Ho, oh, I say, officials, obey my orders, or by the word of an honest man ye shall see what ye were born for. At this some six duennas, advancing across the court, made their appearance in procession, one after the other, four of them with spectacles, and all with their right hands uplifted, showing four fingers of wrist to make their hands look longer, as is the fashion nowadays. No sooner had Sancho caught sight of them than, bellowing like a bull, he exclaimed, I might let myself be handled by all the world, but allow duennas to touch me? Not a bit of it. Scratch my face, as my master was served in this very castle. Run me through the body with burnished daggers. Pinch my arms with red-hot pinchers. I'll bear all in patience to serve these gentlefolk, but I won't let duennas touch me, though the devil should carry me off. Here Don Quixote too broke silence, saying to Sancho, Have patience, my son and gratify these noble persons and give all thanks to heaven that it has infused such virtue into thy person that by its sufferings thou canst disenchant the enchanted and restore to life the dead the duennas were now close to sancho and he having become more tractable and reasonable settling himself well in his chair presented his face and beard to the first who delivered him a smack very stoutly laid on and then made him a low curtsey less politeness and less paint senora duenna said sancho by god your hands smell of vinegar wash in fine all the duennas smacked him and several others of the household pinched him but what he could not stand was being pricked by the pins and so apparently out of patience he started up out of his chair and seizing a lighted torch that stood near him fell upon the duennas and the whole set of his tormentors exclaiming be gone ye ministers of hell I'm not made of brass not to feel such out-of-the-way tortures. At this instant, Altisidora, who probably was tired of having been so long lying on her back, turned on her side, seeing which the bystanders cried out almost with one voice, Altisidora is alive! Altisidora lives! Radamanthus bade Sancho put away his wrath, as the object they had in view was now attained. When Don Quixote saw Altisidora move, he went on his knees to Sancho, saying to him, Now is the time, son of my bowels, not to call thee my squire, for thee to give thyself some of those lashes thou art bound to lay on for the disenchantment of Dulcinea. Now, I say, is the time when the virtue that is in thee is ripe and endowed with efficacy to work the good that is looked for from thee. To which Sancho made answer, That's trick upon trick, I think, and not honey upon pancakes. A nice thing it would be for a whipping to come now on the top of pinches, smacks, and pin-proddings. You had better take a big stone and tie it round my neck and pitch me into a well. I should not mind it much if I am to be always made the cow of the wedding for the cure of other people's ailments. Leave me alone, or else by God I'll fling the whole thing to the dogs, let come what may. Altisidora had by this time sat up on the catafalque, and as she did so the clarion sounded, accompanied by the flutes and the voices of all present exclaiming long life to altisidora long life to altisidora the duke and duchess and the kings minos and rhadamanthus stood up and all together with don quixote and sancho advanced to receive her and take her down from the catafalque and she making as though she were recovering from a swoon bowed her head to the duke and duchess and to the kings and looking sideways at don quixote said to him god forgive thee insensible knight for through thy cruelty i have been to me it seems more than a thousand years in the other world and to thee the most compassionate upon earth i render thanks for the life i am now in possession of from this day forth friend sancho count as thine six smocks of mine which i bestow upon thee to make as many shirts for thyself and if they are not all quite whole at any rate they are all clean 
Sancho kissed her hands in gratitude, kneeling, and with the mitre in his hand. The duke bade them take it from him, and give him back his cap and doublet and remove the flaming robe. Sancho begged the duke to let them leave him the robe and mitre, as he wanted to take them home for a token and memento of that unexampled adventure. The duchess said they must leave them with him, for he knew already what a great friend of his she was. The duke then gave orders that the court should be cleared, and that all should retire to their chambers, and that Don Quixote and Sancho should be conducted to their old quarters. End of Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 69 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 70 Of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra Translated by John Ormsby, 1829-1895 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 70, which follows 69, and deals with matters indispensable for the clear comprehension of this history. Sancho slept that night in a cot in the same chamber with Don Quixote, a thing he would have gladly excused if he could, for he knew very well that with questions and answers his master would not let him sleep and he was in no humour for talking much as he still felt the pain of his late martyrdom which interfered with his freedom of speech and it would have been more to his taste to sleep in a hovel alone than in that luxurious chamber in company and so well founded did his apprehension prove and so correct was his anticipation that scarcely had his master got into bed when he said what dost thou think of to-night's adventure sancho great and mighty is the power of cold-hearted scorn for thou with thine own eyes hast seen altisidora slain not by arrows nor by the sword nor by any warlike weapon nor by deadly poisons but by the thought of the sternness and scorn with which i have always treated her she might have died in welcome said sancho when she pleased and how she pleased and she might have left me alone for i never made her fall in love or scorned her i don't know nor can i imagine how the recovery of altisidora a damsel more fanciful than wise can have as i have said before anything to do with the sufferings of sancho panza now i begin to see plainly and clearly that there are enchanters and enchanted people in the world and may god deliver me from them since i can't deliver myself and so i beg of your worship to let me sleep and not ask me any more questions unless you want me to throw myself out of the window sleep sancho my friend said don quixote if the pin prodding and pinches thou hast received and the smacks administered to thee will let thee no pain came up to the insult of the smacks said sancho for the simple reason that it was duennas confound them that gave them to me but once more i entreat your worship to let me sleep for sleep is relief from misery to those who are miserable when awake be it so and god be with thee said don quixote they fell asleep both of them and cide hamet the author of this great history took this opportunity to record and relate what it was that induced the duke and duchess to get up the elaborate plot that has been described the bachelor samson carrasco he says not forgetting how he as the knight of the mirrors had been vanquished and overthrown by don quixote which defeat and overthrow upset all his plans resolved to try his hand again hoping for better luck than he had before and so having learned where don quixote was from the page who brought the letter and present to sancho's wife teresa panza he got himself new armour and another horse and put a white moon upon his shield and to carry his arms he had a mule led by a peasant not by tom cecil his former squire for fear he should be recognised by sancho or don quixote he came to the duke's castle and the duke informed him of the road and route don quixote had taken with the intention of being present at the jousts at saragossa he told him too of the jokes he had practised upon him and of the device for the disenchantment of dulcinea at the expense of sancho's backside and finally he gave him an account of the trick sancho had played upon his master making him believe that dulcinea was enchanted and turned into a country wench and of how the duchess his wife had persuaded sancho that it was he himself who was deceived inasmuch as dulcinea was really enchanted 
at which the bachelor laughed not a little and marvelled as well at the sharpness and simplicity of sancho as at the length to which don quixote's madness went the duke begged of him if he found him whether he overcame him or not to return that way and let him know the result this the bachelor did he set out in quest of don quixote and not finding him at saragossa he went on and how he fared has been already told he returned to the duke's castle and told him all what the conditions of the combat were and how don quixote was now like a loyal knight-errant returning to keep his promise of retiring to his village for a year by which time said the bachelor he might perhaps be cured of his madness for that was the object that had led him to adopt these disguises as it was a sad thing for a gentleman of such good parts as don quixote to be a madman and so he took his leave of the duke and went home to his village to wait there for don quixote who was coming after him thereupon the duke seized the opportunity of practising this mystification upon him so much did he enjoy everything connected with sancho and don quixote he had the roads about the castle far and near everywhere he thought don quixote was likely to pass on his return occupied by large numbers of his servants on foot and on horseback who were to bring him to the castle by fair means or foul if they met him they did meet him and sent word to the duke who having already settled what was to be done as soon as he heard of his arrival ordered the torches and lamps in the court to be lit and altisidora to be placed on the catafalque with all the pomp and ceremony that has been described the whole affair being so well arranged and acted that it differed but little from reality and cid hamet says moreover that for his part he considers the concocters of the joke as crazy as the victims of it and that the duke and duchess were not two fingers breadth removed from being something like fools themselves when they took such pains to make game of a pair of fools as for the latter one was sleeping soundly and the other lying awake occupied with his desultory thoughts when daylight came to them bringing with it the desire to rise for the lazy down was never a delight to don quixote victor or vanquished altisidora come back from death to life as don quixote fancied following up the freak of her lord and lady entered the chamber crowned with the garland she had worn on the catafalque and in a robe of white taffeta embroidered with gold flowers her hair flowing loose over her shoulders and leaning upon a staff of fine black ebony don quixote disconcerted and in confusion at her appearance huddled himself up and well-nigh covered himself altogether with the sheets and counterpane of the bed tongue-tied and unable to offer her any civility altisidora seated herself on a chair at the head of the bed and after a deep sigh said to him in a feeble soft voice when women of rank and modest maidens trample honour under foot and give a loose to the tongue that breaks through every impediment publishing abroad the inmost secrets of their hearts they are reduced to sore extremities such a one am i senor don quixote of la mancha crushed conquered love smitten but yet patient under suffering and virtuous and so much so that my heart broke with grief and i lost my life for the last two days i have been dead slain by the thought of the cruelty with which thou hast treated me obdurate knight o oh, harder thou than marble to my plaint or at least believed to be dead by all who saw me and had it not been that love taking pity on me let my recovery rest upon the sufferings of this good squire there i should have remained in the other world love might very well have let it rest upon the sufferings of my ass and i should have been obliged to him said sancho but tell me senora and may heaven send you a tenderer lover than my master what did you see in the other world what goes on in hell for of course that's where one who dies in despair is bound for to tell you the truth said altisidora i cannot have died outright for i did not go into hell had i gone in it is very certain i should never have come out again do what i might the truth is i came to the gate where some dozen or so of devils were playing tennis all in breeches and doublets with falling collars trimmed with flemish bone lace and ruffles of the same that served them for wristbands with four fingers breadth of the arms exposed to make their hands look longer in their hands they held rackets of fire but what amazed me still more was that books apparently full of wind and rubbish served them for tennis balls a strange and marvellous thing this however did not astonish me so much as to observe that although with players it is usual 
for the winners to be glad and the losers sorry there in that game all were growling all were snarling and all were cursing one another that's no wonder said sancho for devils whether playing or not can never be content win or lose very likely said altisidora but there is another thing that surprises me too i mean surprised me then and that was that no ball outlasted the first throw or was of any use a second time and it was wonderful the constant succession there was of books new and old to one of them a brand new well-bound one they gave such a stroke that they knocked the guts out of it and scattered the leaves about look what book that is said one devil to another and the other replied it is the second part of the history of don quixote of la mancha not by seed hamet the original author but by an aragonese who by his own account is of tordesillas out of this with it said the first and into the depths of hell with it out of my sight is it so bad said the other so bad is it said the first that if i had set myself deliberately to make a worse i could not have done it they then went on with their game knocking other books about and i having heard them mention the name of don quixote whom i love and adore so took care to retain this vision in my memory a vision it must have been no doubt said don quixote for there is no other eye in the world this history has been going about here for some time from hand to hand but it does not stay long in any for everybody gives it a taste of his foot i am not disturbed by hearing that i am wandering in a fantastic shape in the darkness of the pit or in the daylight above for i am not the one that history treats of if it should be good faithful and true it will have ages of life but if it should be bad from its birth to its burial will not be a very long journey altisidora was about to proceed with her complaint against don quixote when he said to her i have several times told you senora that it grieves me you should have set your affections upon me as from mine they can only receive gratitude but no return i was born to belong to dulcinea del toboso and the fates if there are any dedicated me to her and to suppose that any other beauty can take the place she occupies in my heart is to suppose an impossibility this frank declaration should suffice to make you retire within the bounds of your modesty for no one can bind himself to do impossibilities hearing this altisidora with a show of anger and agitation exclaimed god's life don stockfish soul of a mortar stone of a date more obstinate and obdurate than a clown asked a favour when he has his mind made up if i fall upon you i'll tear your eyes out do you fancy don vanquish don cudgelled that i died for your sake all that you have seen to-night has been make-believe i'm not the woman to let the black of my nail suffer for such a camel much less die that i can well believe said sancho for all that about lovers pining to death is absurd they may talk of it but as for doing it judith may believe that while they were talking the musician singer and poet who had sung the two stanzas given above came in and making a profound obeisance to don quixote said will your worship sir knight reckon and retain me in the number of your most faithful servants for i have long been a great admirer of yours as well because of your fame as because of your achievements will your worship tell me who you are replied don quixote so that my courtesy may be answerable to your deserts the young man replied that he was the musician and songster of the night before of a truth said don quixote your worship has a most excellent voice but what you sang did not seem to me very much to the purpose for what have garcilaso's stanzas to do with the death of this lady don't be surprised at that returned the musician for with the callow poets of our day the way is for every one to write as he pleases and pilfer where he chooses whether it be germane to the matter or not and nowadays there is no piece of silliness they can sing or write that is not set down to poetic license don quixote was about to reply but was prevented by the duke and duchess who came in to see him and with them there followed a long and delightful conversation in the course of which sancho said so many droll and saucy things that he left the duke and duchess wondering not only at his simplicity but at his sharpness don quixote begged their permission to take his departure that same day inasmuch as for a vanquished knight like himself it was fitter he should live in a pigsty than in a royal palace they gave it very readily and the duchess asked him if altisidora was in his good graces 
he replied senora let me tell your ladyship that this damsel's ailment comes entirely of idleness and the cure for it is honest and constant employment she herself has told me that lace is worn in hell and as she must know how to make it let it never be out of her hands for when she is occupied in shifting the bobbins to and fro the image or images of what she loves will not shift to and fro in her thoughts this is the truth this is my opinion and this is my advice and mine added sancho for i never in all my life saw a lace-maker that died for love when damsels are at work their minds are more set on finishing their tasks than on thinking of their loves i speak from my own experience for when i'm digging i never think of my old woman i mean my teresa panza whom i love better than my own eyelids you say well sancho said the duchess and i will take care that my altisidora employs herself henceforward in needlework of some sort for she is extremely expert at it there is no occasion to have recourse to that remedy senora said altisidora for the mere thought of the cruelty with which this vagabond villain has treated me will suffice to blot him out of my memory without any other device with your highness's leave i will retire not to have before my eyes i won't say his rueful countenance but his abominable ugly looks that reminds me of the common saying that he that rails is ready to forgive said the duke altisidora then pretending to wipe away her tears with a handkerchief made an obeisance to her master and mistress and quitted the room ill luck betide thee poor damsel said sancho ill luck betide thee thou hast fallen in with a soul as dry as a rush and a heart as hard as oak had it been me in faith another cock would have crowed to thee so the conversation came to an end and don quixote dressed himself and dined with the duke and duchess and set out the same evening end of volume two part two chapter seventy recording by expatriate in bangor maine Volume two, part two, chapter seventy one of the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby, eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume two, part two, chapter seventy one of what passed between Don Quixote and his squire Sancho on the way to their village the vanquished and afflicted don quixote went along very downcast in one respect and very happy in another his sadness arose from his defeat and his satisfaction from the thought of the virtue that lay in sancho as had been proved by the resurrection of altisidora though it was with difficulty he could persuade himself that the love-smitten damsel had been really dead sancho went along anything but cheerful for it grieved him that altisidora had not kept her promise of giving him the smocks and turning this over in his mind he said to his master surely senor i am the most unlucky doctor in the world there is many a physician that after killing the sick man he had to cure requires to be paid for his work though it is only signing a bit of a list of medicines that the apothecary and not he makes up and there his labour is over but with me though to cure somebody else cost me drops of blood smacks pinches pin proddings and whippings nobody gives me a farthing well i swear by all that's good if they put another patient into my hands they'll have to grease them for me before i cure em for as they say it's by his singing the abbot gets his dinner and i'm not going to believe that heaven has bestowed upon me the virtue i have that i should be dealing it out to others all for nothing thou art right sancho my friend said don quixote and altisidora has behaved very badly in not giving thee the smock she promised and although that virtue of thine is gratis data as it has cost thee no study whatever any more than such study as thy personal sufferings may be i can say for myself that if thou wouldst have payment for the lashes on account of the disenchant of dulcinea i would have given it to thee freely ere this i am not sure however whether payment will comport with the cure and i would not have the reward interfere with the medicine i think there will be nothing lost by trying it consider how much thou wouldst have sancho and whip thyself at once and pay thyself down with thine own hand as thou hast money of mine at this proposal sancho opened his eyes and his ears a palm's breadth wide and in his heart very readily acquiesced in whipping himself and said he to his master 
Very well, then, senor. I'll hold myself in readiness to gratify your worship's wishes if I'm to profit by it, for the love of my wife and children forces me to seem grasping. Let your worship say how much you will pay me for each lash I give myself. If, Sancho, replied Don Quixote, I were to requite thee as the importance and nature of the cure deserves, the treasures of Venice, the mines of Potosi, would be insufficient to pay thee. See what thou hast of mine, and put a price on each lash. Of them, said Sancho, there are three thousand three hundred and odd. Of these I have given myself five, the rest remain. Let the five go for the odd ones, and let us take the three thousand three hundred, which at a quarter real apiece, for I will not take less, though the whole world should bid me, make three thousand three hundred quarter reals. The three thousand are one thousand five hundred half reals, which makes seven hundred and fifty reals, and the three hundred make a hundred and fifty half reals, which come to seventy five reals, which added to the seven hundred and fifty make eight hundred and twenty five reals in all. These I will stop out of what I have belonging to your worship, and I'll return home rich and content, though well whipped, for there's no taking trout, but I say no more. O oh, blessed Sancho, O oh, dear Sancho, said Don Quixote, how we shall be bound to serve thee, Dulcinea and I, all the days of our lives that heaven may grant us. If she returns to her lost shape, and it cannot be but that she will, her misfortune will have been good fortune, and my defeat a most happy triumph. But look here, Sancho, when wilt thou begin the scourging? For if thou wilt make short work of it, I will give thee a hundred reals over and above. When, said Sancho, this night without fail, let your worship order it, so that we pass it out of doors and in the open air, and I'll scarify myself. Night, longed for by Don Quixote with the greatest anxiety in the world, came at last, though it seemed to him that the wheels of Apollo's car had broken down, and that the day was drawing itself out longer than usual, just as is the case with lovers, who never make the reckoning of their desires agree with time. They made their way at length in among some pleasant trees that stood a little distance from the road, and there vacating Rocinante's saddle and Dapple's pack-saddle, they stretched themselves on the green grass and made their supper off Sancho's stores, and he, making a powerful and flexible whip out of Dapple's halter and headstall, retreated about twenty paces from his master among some beech-trees. Don Quixote, seeing him march off with such resolution and spirit, said to him, Take care, my friend, not to cut thyself to pieces. Allow the lashes to wait for one another, and do not be in so great a hurry as to run thyself out of breath midway. I mean, do not lay on so strenuously as to make thy life fail thee before thou hast reached the desired number, and that thou mayest not lose by a card too much or too little, I will station myself apart and count on my rosary here the lashes thou givest thyself. May heaven help thee as thy good intention deserves. Pledges don't distress a good payer, said Sancho. I mean to lay on in such a way as without killing myself to hurt myself, for in that, no doubt, lies the essence of this miracle. He then stripped himself from the waist upwards, and snatching up the rope, he began to lay on and Don Quixote to count the lashes. He might have given himself six or eight when he began to think the joke no trifle and its price very low and holding his hand for a moment, he told his master that he cried off on the score of a blind bargain, for each of those lashes ought to be paid for at the rate of half a real instead of a quarter. Go on, Sancho, my friend, and be not disheartened, said Don Quixote, for I double the stakes as to price. In that case, said Sancho, in God's hand be it, and let it rain lashes. But the rogue no longer laid them on his shoulders, but laid on to the trees with such groans every now and then, that one would have thought at each of them his soul was being plucked up by the roots. Don Quixote, touched to the heart, and fearing he might make an end of himself, and that through Sancho's imprudence he might miss his own object, said to him, As thou livest, my friend, let the matter rest where it is, for the remedy seems to me a very rough one, and it will be well to have patience. Zamora was not one in an hour. If I have not reckoned wrong, thou hast given thyself over a thousand lashes that is enough for the present for the ass to put in homely phrase bears the load but not the overload no no senor replied sancho it shall never be said of me the money paid the arms broken go back a little further your worship and let me give myself at any rate a thousand lashes more for in a couple of bouts like this we shall have finished off the lot 
and there will be even cloth to spare as thou art in such a willing mood said don quixote may heaven aid thee lay on and i'll retire sancho returned to his task with so much resolution that he soon had the bark stripped off several trees such was the severity with which he whipped himself and one time raising his voice and giving a beech a tremendous lash he cried out here dies samson and all with him at the sound of his piteous cry and of the stroke of the cruel lash don quixote ran to him at once and seizing the twisted halter that served him for a corbash said to him heaven forbid sancho my friend that to please me thou shouldst lose thy life which is needed for the support of thy wife and children let dulcinea wait for a better opportunity and i will content myself with a hope soon to be realized and have patience until thou hast gained fresh strength so as to finish off this business to the satisfaction of everybody as your worship will have it so senor said sancho so be it but throw your cloak over my shoulders for i'm sweating and i don't want to take hold it's a risk that novice disciplinants run don quixote obeyed and stripping himself covered sancho who slept until the sun woke him they then resumed their journey which for the time being they brought to an end at a village that lay three leagues farther on they dismounted at a hostelry which don quixote recognized as such and did not take to be a castle with moat turrets portcullis and drawbridge for ever since he had been vanquished he talked more rationally about everything as will be shown presently they quartered him in a room on the ground floor where in place of leather hangings there were pieces of painted serge such as they commonly use in villages on one of them was painted by some very poor hand the rape of helen when the bold guest carried her off from menelaus and on the other was the story of dido and aeneas she on a high tower as though she were making signals with a half sheet to her fugitive guest who was out at sea flying in a frigate or brigantine he noticed in the two stories that helen did not go very reluctantly for she was laughing slyly and roguishly but the fair dido was shown dropping tears the size of walnuts from her eyes don quixote as he looked at them observed those two ladies were very unfortunate not to have been born in this age and i unfortunate above all men not to have been born in theirs had i fallen in with these gentlemen troy would not have been burned or carthage destroyed for it would have been only for me to slay paris and all these misfortunes would have been avoided i'll lay a bet said sancho that before long there won't be a tavern roadside inn hostelry or barber's shop where the story of our doings won't be painted up but i'd like it painted by the hand of a better painter than painted these thou art right sancho said don quixote for this painter is like orbaneja a painter there was at ubeda who when they asked him what he was painting used to say whatever it may turn out and if he chanced to paint a cock he would write under it this is a cock for fear they might think it was a fox the painter or writer for it's all the same who published the history of this new don quixote that has come out must have been one of this sort i think sancho for he painted or wrote whatever it may turn out or perhaps he is like a poet called mauleon that was about the court some years ago who used to answer at haphazard whatever he was asked and on one asking him what deum de deo meant he replied de donde diere but putting this aside tell me sancho hast thou a mind to have another turn at thyself to-night and wouldst thou rather have it indoors or in the open air egad senor said sancho for what i am going to give myself it comes all the same to me whether it is in a house or in the fields still i'd like it to be among trees for i think they are company for me and help me to bear my pain wonderfully and yet it must not be sancho my friend said don quixote but to enable thee to recover strength we must keep it for our own village for at the latest we shall get there the day after to-morrow sancho said he might do as he pleased but that for his own part he would like to finish off the business quickly before his blood cooled and while he had an appetite because in delay there is apt to be danger very often and praying to god and plying the hammer and one take was better than two i'll give these and a sparrow in the hand than a vulture on the wing for god's sake sancho no more proverbs exclaimed don quixote it seems to me thou art becoming sicut erat again speak in a plain simple straightforward way as i have often told thee and thou wilt find the good of it i don't know what bad luck it is of mine said sancho but i can't utter a word without a proverb that is not as good as an argument to my mind however i mean to mend if i can and so for the present the conversation ended
End of Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 71 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine